the 2015 Facilities Geospatial Technology Showcase. This six-month webinar series is hosted by the Campus Facilities Technology Association and organized by the University of Kentucky. I'm Lauren Weaver, and thank you all for joining us today. Today's webinar is being recorded. Both the recording and slides will be made available on the CFTA website following this presentation. The presentation is estimated to run for 45 minutes, with the remaining time dedicated for Q&A. As we move through, please feel free to send any questions during the presentation using the questions dialog box or by raising your hand. Your question will be added to the queue and answered at the end of the presentation as time allows. I'd like to extend a special thank you to today's presenter, Scott Stocking. Scott serves as the Spatial Data Interface Analyst at the University of Chicago Facility Service and is a, a, a repeat presenter for this series. So thank you very much for taking the time to present your information here today. Today's presentation is about the convergence of BIM and GIS within a 3D data model utilizing LiDAR data. The University of Chicago has acquired LiDAR data for the interior and exterior of buildings. Today he will talk about data acquisition, approaches for spatial data development, how data has assisted with planning, design, and implementation, and more. Scott, thank you for joining us today. The webinar is yours. All right, thank you, Lauren, and welcome, everybody. Um, we are going to get in a little bit of some of the work we've done in the last year and a half or so, um, dealing with some acquisition of some LiDAR data in a certain part of the campus and some of the experiences we've had in using that in a, in a BIM and GIS uh, environment, and also some CAD thrown in there as well. So uh, we're pretty much going to cover a lot of territory and uh, different endpoints for the data and how it's going to be utilized within facility services at the university. And there's a lot of different endpoints. We'll talk a little bit about some of them. And then eventually the idea is to migrate all these data sources into a comprehensive 3D model of the campus. So with that, I'll kind of go through the discussion outline. Um, we'll start out by reviewing the Quad Capital Renewal Program, which was the major emphasis behind getting the LIDAR capture in the first place and kind of going down this path. So sort of the reason why the whole project was uh, undertaken. We'll go through some approach on for building the spatial data and sort of our overall thoughts and how we're going to do it and, and, and go through that whole process and kind of walk through it with you. And then we'll go right into the actual acquisition process within LiDAR, BIM, and CAD. So those are the three primary data sources that we're working on, and eventually it rolls itself into GIS and into the 3D model. So we'll kind of walk you through that process. And uh, through the data development, um, the various stages that we went through on that and how it's used uh, interactively within those various uh, three different environments. Um, we'll talk a little bit about next steps, some of the things that we're kind of going through and refining as we've gotten the data. And then, of course, the all-important lessons learned, so things that we can pass along to uh, sort of speed your approach if you want to take this on as a, as a way of capturing data for some of your buildings. Okay, so the Quad Capital Renewal Program um, is uh, is a big deal on at the university. It's, it deals with the central quadrangle of the campus. It's the original 1890s uh, footprint of the campus with the uh, collegiate Gothic buildings. Um, they're all of uh, various aged, uh, and some have aged better than others. Uh, through this slide, you can see some of the good condition in the green. There's some re recent rehab activities been done, but there's a fair number of buildings that do need some substantial work and they've gone through the assessment process to determine some of the lack areas that are lacking um, in having buildings of that vintage. Uh, just back in the day, they didn't have ADA and a bunch of other items. And so uh, they're not exactly what we would consider to be optimal buildings. Uh, and it's a, it's a big part of the campus. I mean, this is where a lot of the the, the core classes are being uh, held in uh, laboratories and so forth. So, I mean, 
we have to get a good grip on this and try to manage this as best as possible because if, if we do take this on, we're going to have to keep the school going while we're rehabbing all this uh, infrastructure. Uh, and then the really big problem is that we don't have plans. So, uh, you know, we do have them in, in, uh, in linen uh, back in the day. That's how they, did, that's how they delivered the, the drawings. So uh, it's certainly not in a digital format or any form, way that we could actually utilize them in some of our existing applications. So the idea was to go in and acquire a fairly large footprint, so 37 buildings and 1.7 million square feet and try to get a really good set of plans out of this process along with some other things that we were trying to accomplish. So we'll kind of walk, through, walk you through some of that. So for building the spatial data, we hired a, a firm to do the LIDAR acquisition. We wanted both exterior and interior, so basically the entire building, uh, with the idea of producing a, an architectural level uh, BIM model uh, for the building. Um, and then we would build data sets that then could roll directly into applications from those deliverables. So um, key part of that is that we had a survey control uh, in state plane coordinates because we knew the endpoint of some of this information was going to go to the GIS. So we stated right up front that the data has to be easily ported into a state plane and use survey control as part of the acquisition process. Um, also, the LiDAR scanning and point clouds were composites by hall. So we had them broken out deliverables basically as, as entities that sit in uh, and exist in, as their, uh, composites by each individual building. So we were able to manage it that way. Um, one of the outcomes of deliverables on that was a set of CAD drawings per a specification that could be directly pushed into our space management system. So we use Arcubus and it uses CAD plans as the, as the base of that system. Um, as I mentioned, the BIM drawings for architectural design studies, so we had a certain level of features that we wanted um, in order to do an architectural model of the building, so things like windows, doors, walls, typical type things, and then also some a very detailed exterior elevation of the building. And then uh, eventually we we're going to roll this data into GIS, so we'll talk a little bit about how that is done and eventually get into our SDI or spatial data infrastructure and our space optimization plans that we have down the road. So GIS is a big driver for that. So to get into the acquisition process, um, we had a first order control point in the middle of the quad, so we required them to shoot that and link it into the building corners uh, as part of the acquisition process so that we knew we were going to get good accurate data that would uh, readily translate into a state plane system. Um, they went in and indicated on their drawings where the scan locations are going to be so you can see them pointed out here and numbered on the first floor of this building so where all the position information was in terms of where the scans were done so we can go back in later and, and pull up that scan of that particular location. Uh, this is a, uh, an actual product for the exterior. This is Rosenwald Hall. Um, so that's, this is the typical kind of product that we got out the other end, and then also an interior uh, shot of that same uh, Rosenwald Hall inside the front door. Um, so these were cloud deliverables that we got from uh, the consultant at the end of the day. And then here's a composite of loading it all into a 3D model within the BIM model itself. So they use the clouds to generate the, the BIM model, and then from the BIM model they roll that out into the CAD uh, drawings that we imported in the, into uh, Arcubus. So um, as you can see, we get good coverage. This is one of the things that we set up as part of our Q&A testing process to make sure that we had cloud covering the entire building and that everything was basically exposed and we had good resolution both on the drawing side and the cloud itself. <coughs> and of course within BIM itself we can do it through a series of link files so the clouds can be linked in directly uh, as linked uh, layers 
uh, in, in BIM. So this is an example of that floor plan where some of the cloud uh, data has been linked directly into the model. So you can use that interactively if you haven't done that in the past. It's kind of a nice little feature uh, where you're able to get some additional detail and maybe pull out some additional features on the drawing um, uh, that aren't in the drawing itself. Um, and then, of course, uh, they're in state plane coordinates and they're linked in by uh, adjacent uh, halls. Uh, so these are two adjacent halls to Rosenwald, which is in the top left corner. And so we're able just through through link building links uh, in, in BIM to link in other models and associate them directly into one full composite. We could load the entire quad into one BIM model, 3D model. Uh, that would take a pretty large computer to do that. I think we've done some runs on that and have been able to get it to work, but quite a bit, quite a few objects. Uh, but uh, it, certainly the ability is there to to do that uh, if needed. Um, this is just a section that's one of the deliverables that came out of the process as it required the uh, the firm that did the acquisition and the BIM model creation to give us a section of all four sides of the building. That's a big concern in the quad because you've got floors at different elevations at different buildings. So if they're connected, how the floors actually link in, they go down steps, those kinds of things to get it over to the next building. Um, then we've linked in the clouds as part of that process. So you can see that uh, along with the BIM drawing. And then here's a 3D model of the uh, composite. Um, we're able to take this out directly as 3D objects and load that into our 3D modeling process. And we'll kind of walk you through that a little bit. So we get all this, this wonderful detail on the building. Um, uh, and these buildings are quite detailed. So we're able to uh, grab all that information and able to move it into the 3D model itself. So that was the BIM side of the things. On the GIS side, um, we didn't have the information, of course, in state plane coordinates. Uh, it sits as CAD drawings in, in our Archibus system. So we have to go in and georeference them. And uh, that's a pain. And it's also we lose some accuracy in that. So this is an example of the, the aerial photograph and loading in some footprints, again, in the central quad. Um, and we go through and load in uh, floor plan uh, rooms in this case, and then actually the floor plan data. Um, so we have to bring in individual uh, buildings by floor and then and, and, uh, geo-reference them and uh, go through a laborious process to get them linked in and make sure that they they come in correctly and that they link in at, at uh, building intersections and hallways and stuff. And it's very tricky. It's very hard to do takes a lot of time to do it, but that's really the basically the way you have to do it if you don't have um, your source data coming in in state plane. And certainly when these CAD drawings were generated for Archibus, we didn't have any envision pushing them into a, into a GIS or any kind of 3D space. Um, so with the BIM model coming over, they're in state plane coordinates. So basically we can just take the the CAD model directly and just load it right in. There's no geo-referencing. And we were very meticulous in making sure that that process of exporting the CAD files out of the BIM drawings in state plane did not uh, uh, degrade the quality of the, uh, of the capture so that we're actually getting all that uh, sub-meter uh, accuracy um, get translated directly into the GIS. So we we're very careful in that and um, that actually turned out quite well. Um, again, all these these linkages and you know if you geo-reference buildings that are uh, separate but joined together either through through uh, entryways or, or uh, bridges or directly connected very difficult to do correctly and get them lined up so the wall has a, in common. Um, and some of the testing we did, this is another building within the quad. You see this little red triangle in the corner. This was something we did when we did the, um, the survey control, did the first order monumentation in the quad, is we also had 
the person who set that up go in and do through laser points and survey control, get us building corners uh, throughout the campus so that we had good building corner uh, um, shots that would tell us where, where uh, these areas were so that as we were developing the GIS, we could, we could test for the accuracy. <clears throat> so in zooming way in on this, this green figure is a geo-referenced CAD drawing that we had in, in the system, in the GIS uh, originally. And you can see that we uh, didn't do too well based on the survey point. But the new stuff coming in, through the BIM model, very, very good. So this actually comes in at, you know, a very, very tight tolerance. Uh, so basically we are, you know, hitting the target, so to speak, and getting a much better accuracy. So not only is it coming in much quicker where we don't have to do the layers and geo-reference everything, but the accuracy is also being maintained. <clears throat> okay, so and we'll walk through a little bit about the geo database import within the CAD drawings. So um, as I mentioned, we use the CAD drawings that are in SIM. So for buildings that we don't have a BIM model or any kind of cloud LIDAR data, you basically have to use the repository of the CAD drawings that are sitting in SIMS and Archibus. Um, and well, you know, at, through the BIM modeling process, we don't have to do the geo-referencing uh, which is a nice part of the BIM conversion process. But for feature classes, we can select by CAD layers. So that is something that is set up currently in, in the Archibus uh, space management system where they've got names, layers, and delineations in the CAD drawings that we can then link in and create uh, polygon features from. And we'll kind of walk you through that. And then we basically go in and we add attributes for feature ID and elevation. So these are things that we just do for internal tracking purposes and also obviously for the elevation data to get the 3D model running. <clears throat> so here's a screenshot of a, a, a geo-reference building coming in. Um, this is what the, what the file looks like when it comes over from CAD and SIMS. And we go in and we get four corner points. Uh, and we basically go in and do the geo-referencing of the CAD drawing on there. Um, and then we go through and select out by feature attributes. So under the current Archibus system, we have this gross dollar sign uh, line feature, which is the exterior line building line of the actual model. So we select that as, as, a, as a feature and then copy that out. Um, we also do it for um, room dollar sign and copy that out for, for a room line at work to get our room delineations and copy that out. And then we create polygons off those features. So here's an example of a, uh, of a gross dollar sign line work that came over for this model. Um, and then we add our extra items in here. So for things like street addresses, it's building ID, which in this case is D24. We have a building elevation in both meters and feet. Meters uh, we have for city engine because some of the um, hooks on city engine uses actual meters as opposed to feet. Uh, so we carry both uh, on our database. Our data class is what we internally classify the GIS data polygon. Um, a class one is ex extremely high uh, resolution that came in over cloud. Class two might be a surveyed uh, file that came over from CAD from a known source. And class three is a geo-referenced type thing. So we know what that's going to come in under the tolerance of the aerials, plus or minus a foot, uh, generally, is typically what we get for actual resolution on that. And then um, the Rosenwald Hall, which is the name of it. So just a few key items that we put in for attribution. Everything else is business data, and we keep that separate. So you'll be going to be able to link it in through typically a building ID or a unique ID, for in this case, location ID, which we have <coughs> listed in there for like Chicago ID, you know, 20, D, Chicago D24. So we do have facilities worldwide, so we have 
other things for like Hong Kong and other other locations where you know that sequence would get you you know a unique ID for that particular facility. And then here's an example we have for rooms again for this building. This has had five um, floors and a basement, uh, similar type thing again. So we've got you know a building ID. We got a contaminated field, which is the building ID floor and room number all put in here, which is this this particular item right here. Um, we have different uh, ceiling and height uh, elevation data um, associated with this. So it's sort of like the overall floor may be uh, for that particular building may be 3.2 meters, but the actual floor elevation may be different depending on whether it's a clear story, it's open for two stories, or it's a lecture hall and it sits through a number of floors and stuff. So we're able to get to it um, by setting a different, you know, base elevation, uh, ceiling height, and then an actual elevation of the finished floor for that particular room. Um, and then just very, very, very basic uh, information, you know, associate that with the room number and that's it. So everything else is business data. Uh, for purposes of GIS, and we don't necessarily carry that in the, in the database. So one of the things we did after we went through and created the BIM drawings and pulled out the CAD drawings from those BIM models and put them into the GIS is we also wanted to utilize the point cloud data uh, internally. So we used um, Feral Scene Viewer to do that. Um, so the ability of stat me able to go in and quickly look up any given point in the, uh, on campus where we had cloud data and be able to pull up the clouds and actually take a look at it. Um, <clears throat> we set it up so that the, the viewer could be used by very low end computers. So we're like most uh, agencies where we don't have, people don't have these massive machines to move large cloud data around. So we purposely set the benchmarks and the and the computing uh, demand of this scene viewer at the very lowest possible end we could get to ensure that the, the viewing would be fairly quick and people wouldn't be sitting on their computer waiting for five or ten minutes for the cloud to show up. Um, we also have a very easy navigation system to find and view the cloud very easily. Um, <clears throat> and we, we have a method for sharing the point clouds with collaborators. So we're kind of getting that, um, uh, we're starting to do that now, where we're actually pushing clouds out to other vendors, other contractors and engineers who want to use that information and, and acquire assets that are, already, that are not currently in our BIM model, so things that we didn't add as part of our modeling process. Again, we only acquired it for really basic and architectural features, so we didn't load in things like um, uh, water fountains and lights and any any fixtures or switches or anything like that. Um, <clears throat> and this will also help us verify the survey data that comes in and for project specifications and stuff. So we're able to go in and take a look at the data in, in terms of the clouds and be able to verify um, what they're doing out there in the field for survey. So it's a good good quick way for them to spool up their individual surveys for their projects. So just kind of walk you through how it's organized. Um, it sits on a file server, and we have it in a point cloud and a spatial data uh, file server. Um, it's listed out by hall, so D21 Cobb Hall. And then we have it broken out by interior and exterior cloud. So we broke that up in order to help also segment it out so that we weren't trying to load a total composite of the whole building in one shot. And then in each core area in the interior, we have this simple PDF drawing set up for that for Cobb Hall. So basically, they've got five floors in a basement. So you can pull up this PDF file and take a look at it by floor. Um, so in this case, we're looking at the first floor of Cobb Hall. And again, those survey those scan locations are all indicated. So you can say, if I want to go into classroom 107, I want to pull up these two scans, and that's the area that's going to cover that particular area. If you're in a hallway in here, you're going to pull up 01 and 04. Um, and then 
once you know what you what you're looking for in terms of the the building and what floor and and what scan you're going to look through, you can pull up the scene viewer right here, and this is this is the interface that the staff uses. So it's very straightforward. Obviously, the exterior buildings have exterior shots of the building, and the interior has interior shots. So uh, you can kind of quickly scroll through this, find the particular building that you're interested in, and click on it. And that will load in your uh, workspace for that building. Uh, in this case, we did an interior one in Cobb Hall, and it's all scattered in. So one of the things we didn't do, and second thought we probably should have, is um, specified the actual file structure of the scan naming convention. So that was left to the vendor. He did a decent job of it, but by and large, it's kind of all over the map, and there's really no consistency. So you just have to kind of load them in individually. So it took some time for me to set this up, but but basically on the we've got all the first floor scans all organized in here, and you can go in and target the ones you want to load. So we don't start out from the beginning and try to load the entire interior of the building. We go in and give you the the exposure to get the first you know the first floor of Cobb Hall or whatever, and then you go in and based on your survey and say, I want to load in the scan. And it goes through and loads in a reduced uh, file size, and they're a very small subsample of the cloud data so that it actually loads quickly and we can actually view the cloud. So here, here's an example. We loaded in these, I don't know, there's some maybe 10 scans for this particular exterior shot. Um, um, you can click on these scans if you've ever used actual the, the software itself. You can click on the scan um, listing over here in the in the workspace, and it'll highlight that scan on the screen. So it's got some nice little features. You obviously can zoom in and out. You can rotate the features. You can load and unload data. So if you wanted to have some more detail around this corner or so forth, you can add some additional scans and go in. Um, there is the ability to actually load and show the scan locations on this uh, view. So if you wanted to go in and click on a particular scan and say, what's that one? That one looks like the one I might need. There is the ability to do that. So it's a it's a pretty useful little tool. And it, it runs very, very well. We've been running it on laptops that are, you know, not not four megabits, uh, uh, four gigabytes of RAM, let's say. and um, not a quick processor at all. I mean, four or five-year-old machines, or some cases even older, and this thing runs just fine. It loads up quickly. You're able to navigate the clouds and stuff. So it's a nice little tool. It's a way to publish it out so the staff has access to it. <clears throat> so one of the things, if you attended any of my other talks that were really interested in getting a grip on here in University of Chicago, this is the Euclidean uh, Unlimited Detail Technology. And this is a point cloud technology out of Australia that allow you to view point clouds at full resolution. So um, if, if you've used point clouds at all, to any level of uh, uh, detail, you understand what it takes to uh, actually manipulate this data and set it up in such a way that it's actually useful. Um, if you can utilize a full resolution point cloud, that would be an enormous uh, plus. Uh, not only in terms of the resolution, but for data extraction and just a whole slew of things uh, that you can deal with it. And also in terms of just being able to actually view that data and manage it without constantly going in and degrading the imaging and so on. So it's a it's sort of no one's ever thought you could ever do it, but uh, it looks like they've uh, they've cracked the nut. And they do have a an unlimited detail plug-in for applications and also on the web that they just recently put out there. Um, the big thing for us is if this actually does work, then we'll use point clouds to provide our materials and textures for our virtual campus visualization. Um, providing materials and textures on object surfaces in any data model, I don't care what you use, BIM, uh, GIS, SketchUp, 
uh, Unity, if you're doing it in a video video setup, it's extremely challenging to um, map materials adequately on mesh uh, objects um, in a scene. So uh, this would this would uh, certainly uh, get around that thing because the detail that you would get would be way beyond uh, anything you could possibly get on this under uh, a typical uh, material mapping process in any any known program right now. So we're currently testing the Euclidean um, UD technology right now with our existing point cloud data. The initial results have been, been promising. We're now getting in some very, very high detailed resolution data and hopefully by this summer I'll know whether this is real or not. Um, the uh, Again, this is some just initial data load. This is their their converter process, um, and uh, you go in and basically load it in, and it converts it into their unlimited detailed format. Um, and some of the imagery that they have out there is pretty amazing. This is an exterior shot. This is a point cloud um, of uh, a jungle in Australia. This is some churches and some other areas that they've uh, they've done some high high resolution scanning on. For the exterior, as you can see, the, the amount of detail richness you have on this is way beyond anything I could ever hope to get on a texture file. Um, and also the interior. So it looks like a photograph, um, basically. And so if this stuff works, it's going to be a it's going to be a major boon to the visualization setup on this uh, for our virtual campus. So for next steps, um, one of the things that we're thinking about doing is whether we want to take our our point cloud um, data and put it into a common for format like LIS or RCP is actually Autodesk, but that's pretty much straightforward. You know, most of our stuff is going to be used in a linked file within a BIM model, so that would be uh, an appropriate uh, format to set it in. Um, or whether we just uh, you know keep it in. Right now we use it in in Faro format, which is the scanner they use. Um, so whether we want to put it in a more open framework, more proprietary, or we just use Euclidean UD. So this is all just until we decide Euclidean's real or not. Um, it's just kind of left until we don't have to make any decisions in these areas. But it's some. Something we probably would want to do is put it in an LAS format, a more open standards format, or something, so that we can can control it and manage it down the line. Um, we're moving all the CAD floor plans now from the BIM model into Archibus. That's sort of the first step. Once they do all that magic, and we know that it's all linked in properly in Archibus as the system of record for the building, we'll then take that those drawing sets when they're done and then gone through that process and then migrate them into GIS. Um, eventually the GIS data will be pushed into the central repository. Our target is city GML model. Um, and that will be a composite of both GIS and BIM models. So GIS is already conversion tools that take that <clears throat> and push it into the city GML format. So our 3D model will basically stage it in city engine. Um, uh, make sure it's all set and and working properly as a as a composite, as a 3D uh, geo database, and then um, and then uh, push it out. Uh, BIM models will, con will consume directly. Uh, again, the BIM models will come in under standard as state plane, uh, and then we'll object uh, we'll push those objects out using IFC and convert them into city GML. So that's sort of the plan. It'll be a two part process. Not every Building on campus will have BIM models anytime soon. We, uh, fortunately, we'll have the central quad and some of the larger big capital projects all have BIM models. But it'll be a it'll be a while before we get uh, a complete campus wide um, uh, availability of BIM models. And then eventually we'll roll all that data into a space optimization um, program that we're looking to uh, get going here in the next year or so, and that uses a geo database. Um, so uh, the SIMs will be all linked in. They'll be using the same CAD formats and creating the GIS database, um, geo database. So they'll all be linked in perfectly. 
<clears throat> this is just an example again of our virtual campus model. So um, this is a distant shot of uh, the Hyde Park area and the campus, which are the shaded buildings in the middle. Um, some of the more detailed buildings you see uh, off in the distance there, those are either BIM models or SketchUp models that are draped over the existing GIS. And these are just extruded footprints of the buildings um, uh, in City Engine and then exported out and put into Unity uh, gaming software to for our virtual campus view. So right now there's really not a whole lot of detail other than maybe the exterior might have it coming over from the GIS. <clears throat> but when we finish the building conversion and geodatabase, we'll push that in the city engine and then we'll be able to delineate floors and rooms within those polygons. So that'll be a major upgrade on all that. And it'll be included in the visualization tool. Um, we've also got composites in here where we do have more detailed BIM data um, that's also brought in uh, that replaces the, the CAD version of that building to a more detailed BIM model. <clears throat> We've just recently uh, tested moving a very detailed construction BIM model into Unity um, and seeing how well that handles uh, things. It's quite a bit more objects than just a general architectural model, which we've done in the past. Um, so we've broken it out by exterior and interior objects and then furniture objects and brought them in as different layers uh, in the virtual campus and are displaying those uh, actually in Unity now. Um, nice that Unity's finally gone up. Uh, version 5 now is um, um, is a 64-bit program, so we don't have the kind of limitations we had in in the past uh, trying to work on the virtual campus. <clears throat> and then this is just a detailed view again in Unity. Um, this is just a uh, extruded building um, footprint based on the georeference CAD files in City Engine and exported into Unity. And then where we had SketchUp data draped over it and stuff. So um, this is pretty cleaned up. Uh, version of what it looks like on a detail. I mean, and even then you can still see there's some errors. So like in here, there's some polygons that didn't get texture information. I spent quite a bit of time going in here and cleaning this thing up so that all the textures are mapped. So obviously if the point clouds actually come true and we're able to bring those over as a, as a feature for the textures and just wrap our geometry around it, uh, that's going to be the way to go. So. Uh, just sort of an example. Even with a touched up version, um, you can still see that there's some, some work to do on the model. <clears throat> okay, so kind of wrap up uh, lessons learned uh, for LIDAR acquisition. Um, the devil's in the details on this. Um, we didn't specify that the point clouds had to be in state plane coordinates because we never dreamed that the vendor would ever do it in any other way. Uh, especially since the um, deliverables in both the BIM model and CAD were supposed to be in state plane coordinates. We just made this assumption that they would do that, and they didn't. Uh, so basically the clouds are just in whatever arbitrary coordinate system they set up for that building, and through the shot, uh, shots of the scans themselves and the wall shots and so forth, and they, they exist and function fine as a building set, but they not in state plane coordinates. So that's a bad thing, and the fact that we can't really utilize the clouds in a state plane system like GIS or anything else. Um, it's, there's no doubt it's an affordable method to get high quality building plans. Um, it's uh, for us to go through it in another way to get that much data over a short period of time would be uh, prohibitive. There's just no doubt about it. And we did hire a firm that, that did this that does this for a living. So they, they do this for architects. They basically go out and scan existing structures, give them base floor plans. So they know how to do it. They enlarge the quality control with good, and the, the results were, were very, very good. Um, but we do have to establish some strong quality QA, QC procedures. Uh, the vendor still uh, was struggling with the whole state plane coordinate issue and why we needed that and why we test so rigorously on that, on, on origin files and uh, on CAD deliverables and things. And, you know, we kind of had to go through some hard knocks on that. But 
eventually we all got on the same page. So I think maybe going forward, if you are actually going to do this, um, hire a vendor that understands state plane and why it is important and has worked with it in the past. <clears throat> for spatial data uh, collection and for BIM systems of record for new projects, this is something that we're thinking about doing as part of our BIM standards process. And for us to go out and, and acquire uh, BIM scans for the rest of the campus as its own project within facility services for just the purposes of acquiring uh, more detailed building plans or architectural features is not likely. Um, you know, it's, it costs millions of dollars, and uh, it's unlikely we would get that. But if it's as part of a major project rehab, and obviously a new project or something, new uh, capital project that's going to be included in the BIM standard, we'll get that anyway as objects. But if it's a major rehab of a building and stuff, maybe <clears throat> just as part of that project, even if it's just a floor or an MEP system or whatever, we require the vendor to go out and give us a complete cloud a complete scan of the building and we cover it as part of our project cost and that's a way to get the scan and then depending on who the vendor is we may have them produce the architectural models or we'll take those clouds and hand it to somebody who's more proficient in doing that. Um, and as I mentioned before utilizing the clouds for visualization is huge and that fact we don't have to map um, textures in our visualization models so that's a promise that we're going to find out certainly by the end of the year whether that's something that we can actually uh, make happen and, and it would be real. Um, and then finally, um, the management of the cloud is linked into the BIM models. It's pretty straightforward. Um, it's a nice feature. You're able to look at the cloud in relation to your model. Um, so for folks that can do that type of thing, we've set up the BIM system of record in our modeling software so that these links are available and it's all managed, so you can turn them on and off as needed, and we can deliver that to other vendors, other architects, or um, contractors, or whatever, as a as a as a deliverable, as a takeoff point for them to use, and um, however they need for new projects. All right, that's it. Thank you. Scott, thank you for sharing your work with LIDAR and related technologies with us. You've definitely done a, a lot of groundwork in that area that we can benefit from seeing. Um, it's amazing to me to see the level of detail that can come out of LIDAR. I've, I've known for a while that LIDAR is pretty incredible stuff, but I actually thought that a couple of those examples you showed were pictures, and I was waiting to see the, <laughs> the LIDAR deliverable, and then, I, then you said that those were the LIDAR. So that was, that was pretty neat to see. Um, at this time, we'll move to the Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have any questions that you've not yet submitted, feel free to send using the question dialog box, and I'll add them to the queue as time allows. Um, uh, we do have several questions here. Uh, first, can you talk a little bit more about the space optimization program using the geodatabases of buildings that you mentioned there? What are, what are your plans for that? Well, this is something that we've been trying to um, get started here over the last couple of years. Is um, we're we're trying to work with um, NASA Langley on their uh, space op um, optimization program that runs on ArcGIS server and a geo database, and they've got some wonderful tools. Um, it requires a geo database, a 3D model, and so we're hopeful that one of the outcomes of this project when we're done building the 3D model is to plug it into that process and do some some space optimization things. So it does things like scenario buildings for like minimum standards for office sizes, but it also gets into staffing and other components that are just really powerful and analytic tools that um, would be a good add-on to our space management system. So space management is good for getting a grip in terms of how many square feet we have and what type of rooms we have and who uses them. Um, but going through a scenario, particularly in this quad capital re renewal area where we're going to repurpose these buildings and basically gut them and re redesign them with the optimal design parameter for each of these individual halls and then 
as a composite to meet the university's needs. So, um, you know, I think the only way to do that is through an optimization program that can go in and and through many, many different layers of analytics go in and try to get an optimal setup and run scenarios that, uh, you know, within a certain set of parameters. So they've done a, a lot of work in it and um, we would, we're working to to get it set up and collaborate with them in the future so that we can get uh, some things set up. They're, good. They're obviously more set up for NASA laboratory work and, and that kind of thing. Um, we would add tool sets that are more higher education things. So things that we have that they don't have, like residence halls, athletic facilities, those kinds of things. <clears throat> okay, that sounds like a great opportunity for collaboration. I've heard really great things about what they're doing as well. So I'm sure you guys can make some discoveries together there. Uh, that does lead well into the next question. I'm curious as to what ways has the LIDAR data already been leveraged by different groups or departments on your campuses? And you mentioned a little bit about design and planning. How, how has the LIDAR data been used specifically to support campus things? Well, we've actually just recently, I've been sending entire cl uh, cl building clouds to contractors. So um, this is uh, something that we thought might happen, but now it's starting to, where pe people are, know that we have this information and we basically put it out out there and have them grab it. And, um, you know, they can, they can get our base architectural drawing <clears throat> in BIM or in CAD and they can use that cloud to go in and, and get features that they need for their particular project. So um, that's one way that it's starting to, to be used. Um, we put it out there for staff to use and we've kind of published it and so forth. And so far, staff hasn't really jumped in very much to look at it um, on this, uh, on a, at a cloud level. Um, but uh, certainly, um, going forward in the future, if we want, since we have the cloud, if we want to go through an acquisition process and get more detail on it, it's a, it's a much easier proposition to do um, additional features, different additional objects into the model. Um, <clears throat> I just, I think it's a good quality control uh, process too, because as we go through and build a system of record on a on a given building and we started adding features that are coming in from project objects, you know, having the cloud there is going to help us try to determine what's really going on, you know, for, from past um, existing facilities to new facilities. So it's probably another use that it's going to enter into at some point. <laughs> it sounds like with what you're doing, you're trying to make it easier to access, more user-friendly, quicker run to so as those efforts move forward, I imagine there'll be even more utility for the information. So. Yeah, I mean, there'd be some things where they could possibly redline and do other things to send it out and stuff. But, you know, again, we just have to take one step at a time. But at least it's now in a format that pretty much everybody can get to in a department. Mm -hmm. You'd showed how to locate a building in the list of buildings, interior and exterior photos, and then you can move from that link to a workspace and it opens up. Is it possible to put that into a map format? Of course, we have a lot of geography folks here. <laughs> Could you put that into <laughs> a map yeah, and then be able to yeah. navigate through the map? It, and it, it actually does do that. It uses Google Maps, though. So okay. there, there is a link that's built into the scene program. And we've, we've, we've enabled it, so you can basically go out to Google Maps and it'll locate that building on a Google Map scene. Uh, so if you're not from the campus, you know, and you don't know what, you know, where that thing is, or you kind of know where, what, what, where you're, what part of campus you're looking at, it does, it does have that link in there already built in. I just didn't show it. Okay. Does that work pretty well, or is it kind of clunky? It actually works like, pretty, yeah. it actually works pretty well. I mean, I, I've tried it a couple times. I used it for a testing, obviously, and and uh, once I found it was there, I just enabled the link, and uh, yeah, it it works fine. Okay, very cool, very cool. Uh, now, how long did it take to acquire the initial lidar data? And I understand you just have a, a sample of campus right now of lidar data. How how intensive was that process? 
Well, I think the acquisition process took over a year, and part of it is the challenge, of course, is scheduling it. Um, so we did a lot of it in the summer when there's not classes going on. So, um, you know, once once they got in there, um, you know, they could knock it out pretty much in a summer for the area that we're looking at. And then it was going back in on quality control and getting areas that they missed or couldn't access for whatever reason. It was locked or, you know, there was some other reason why they couldn't get get into that particular room or whatever. So that was more tricky and that took a lot longer. So, you know, getting in and knocking it out in the summer and then doing the the quality control and, and trying to finish up a building in areas missed were more like spring break or, you know, weekends or at night. And, um, of course, disclaimer, if, as, what, what, with whatever you are comfortable saying or able to say, what kind of investment is involved in the data acquisition process? Um, you know, I think we spent, um, we spent a couple, you know, I spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on, on, the, on the acquisition. Um, so it's, that's, that's what I'm saying is it's not cheap, and I think we got a really good price for it because basically we're dealing with people that do this for a living and know how to produce the, the drawing set. So those price points are coming down and stuff, but it is still a pretty pricey, um, you know, proposition for universities to tackle this if they wanted to really do this for existing buildings um, over time. And I think that's why we're exploring, you know, doing it through project work because um, there we can, you know, a capital expenditure uh, to scan the entire building and capture it in the cloud. A lot of that they're going to be doing anyway, if it's a fairly extensive renovation of an existing project where they're existing and then post um, as built. So, you know, that's pretty much getting to be standard practice anyway. So we're saying if you're already going in there and scanning a big chunk of the building that's directly related to the project, why don't we just pay you an extra increment to get the rest of it? Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Interesting. It'll be interesting to see what you guys do moving forward if you do go about acquiring the rest of the campus. Um, that would be pretty neat. Uh, well, once you do have the data, how do you go about maintaining it? Or what, what degree of <laughs> maintenance is needed? What kind of workflows are there for, for keeping that up to date? Yes. That, that's the area now that we're starting to struggle and, and through our BIM standards and stuff. So just trying to keep the BIM standards record model current and how do we do that effectively through our standards process. And then certainly the cloud is another level of that. So my guess is that we'll have it in a directory format similar to what we have now. And when we get new clouds in there, we're just going to have to manually replace them. You know, we know where what clouds are in what room. Fortunately, we have that master drawing. So. Um, if we get new cloud data for that particular area, we may just archive the old one and replace the new and it just update the links. So there may be a way to do that in, in BIM pretty straightforward. And then it also exists within the Feral scene then. So just be very straightforward on it. But it's more management on the BIM objects that has me um, nervous and trying to figure out how to do the updates of those BIM drawings, even at just an architectural level. So the understanding is that you know we have this core BIM um, system of record now within the, the quad building, so it's purely architectural. But when we add MEP, or we add furniture, or we add uh, we make changes to the architectural, um, that's put into the original system of record, kind of, and we get a composite. So over time, eventually through project work. Um, we will get an incomplete BIM model. But that obviously is going to take you know some time and also some management on how to do that effectively. Yeah, yeah, I imagine. All right. All right, well, I think that wraps up our Q&A session. So thank you, Scott. Is this your last presentation? It is. Three, right? You have presented three times. Yes. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you for contributing. Um, it's really appreciated. My pleasure. Yeah have learned a lot from your presentation. So thank you on behalf of everybody who's attended and is passing on knowledge. <laughs> um.
With that, I'd like to wrap up. Um, thank you to all of our attendees joining us today and at the other sessions. You can access the recording and slides from the CFTA website for this and previous presentations following the webinar. If we weren't able to answer your question or if you have any additional questions, please feel free to contact Scott directly and you can see his contact information is on the screen now. The next webinar in the Geotech Showcase is scheduled for 11 a.m. Eastern Time on April 28th. Tom McCaffrey, GIS and Records Management Director at the University of Calgary, Alberta, will present Maximizing the Strength of GIS in Facilities. That will be really interesting. Um, uh, for more information on future webinars in this series and more, please visit the CFTA website at www.cf.org. Thank you.